thank you very much, Angeline. Uh, can, can you hear me? It's okay. And I thank the organizers for the opportunity to present in this conference. I had a, an amazing yesterday, the whole day and the evening. So it was a real pleasure to be here. So I'm just going to, uh, actually I have to thank the previous speakers as well who have covered uh, a lot about nutrition. My talk is uh, limited to surgical intensive care unit. So nutrition support has traditionally been taught that it is a very important adjunct therapy. But over the years, people working in ICU have realized that it is no more an adjunct therapy. It is actually uh, a very important part of the whole uh, uh, treatment management uh, process in the ICU. And surgical ICU patients are a little bit different to the medical ICU patients. And uh, studies have shown that nutrition support in surgical patients is, uh, is worse than uh, the medical ICU because they are less likely to receive enteral nutrition and they are more likely to receive parenteral nutrition because of the uh, GI surgeries, a lot of them cannot be fed enterally. And enteral nutrition when it is started, it is started about 24 hours later than compared to the medical uh, ICU. And they are also less likely to achieve the target, the, the caloric and the protein targets. And this happens because um, uh, many of the surgical patients, they are scheduled for repeated visits to the operating room and the traditional NPO status don't uh, to uh, uh, not feed the surgical patients for 12 hours in some ICUs uh, is still practiced in uh, for many patients. So that really leaves very little time to feed these patients. Then uh, many surgical patients in ICU, they've had uh, GI surgeries and they have, uh, they are at very high risk of GI complications. So all these things, they contribute uh, to um, very low caloric as well as protein replacement in uh, surgical patients. And these are the patients who need nutrition even more than a medical ICU patients because of, uh, most of the patients in surgical ICU will have wounds. They have been to uh, operating rooms and repeatedly. So uh, these are the patients who need more uh, proteins to uh, improve the wound healing. And it, when they are deprived of uh, nutrition, then the wound healing process is delayed. And obviously the muscle weakness uh, not only delays their mobilization, but it affects their respiratory function and uh, they, they have more days uh, spent on the ventilators. And uh, they are also at a higher risk of uh, pulmonary and other infections and many post-operative uh, complications as well. And this leads to uh, higher mortality, longer ICU stays, and longer ICU stays then translate to more financial impact. So in uh, surgical ICUs, uh, giving appropriate caloric and protein targets is very important uh, to improve outcomes. There are many controversies uh, surrounding uh, nutrition therapy generally in critically ill patients and especially in surgical patients. So I'll just uh, touch a few of them. So traditionally, up till like 2009, uh, we were following the both ESPN guidelines and the ASPN guidelines, and we were told that the uh, critically ill patients should be fed very aggressively and as early as uh, possible. But a recent uh, uh, many randomized clinical trials have shown uh, that early aggressive overnutrition uh, might be harmful instead of the benefits that were uh, expected. And the question that whether uh, enteral nutrition is better than parenteral nutrition, uh, this has also now been answered uh, in view of the uh, recent uh, uh, clinical trials. So obviously enteral nutrition has many advantages because when you are using the gut, it maintains the gut motility. The gastric uh, mucosa is not uh, 
uh, uh, doesn't atrophy and that prevents translocation of bacteria and endotoxins from the gut which is the main reason for increased septic complications. So there are many advantages of uh, using the gut but even enteral nutrition is not without complications if it is not done properly, position is not maintained, patients are at a higher risk of aspiration, reflux, diarrhea, gastric stasis. And then we have parenteral nutrition which is used uh, when you cannot feed the patient enterally or the patient, the uh, uh, enteral route is not sufficient to give uh, the required calories because the demand is very high especially in uh, burns patient or you cannot use the gut at all and obviously parenteral nutrition is associated with many complications that are not seen in enteral nutrition. So this uh, caloric trial that was uh, uh, published in 2014, it showed that actually when the patients were uh, randomized to uh, either be fed enterally or fed parenterally, there was no difference in the primary outcome which was uh, mortality. So it really doesn't matter whether enteral root is used or parenteral uh, root is used. And the infective complications that are associated with parenteral nutrition were basically because the patients who were fed parenterally got more calories. So if uh, it is ensured that the uh, caloric intake does not exceed the requirement, then actually there is not much difference between enteral and parenteral uh, nutrition. So the more important thing is not to overfeed the patients or give them more calories that are uh, needed. And especially with the parenteral route, if they receive more calories, then they are at a higher risk of um, getting infective complications. Then the other um, controversy that was lingering on was uh, when to start the parenteral nutrition. Up till 2009, uh, the two parts of the world were doing different things. So in, uh, in the European intensive care uh, units, it was uh, very common to start parenteral nutrition uh, even within two days if they were, they were not able to be fed enterally, whereas in America and Canada, the guidelines suggested to withhold parenteral nutrition. But in, uh, because of the uh, three or four uh, randomized control uh, trials now, uh, a consensus has been reached across the world that it is better not to supplement uh, enteral nutrition if it is inadequate for at least eight days. So now there is consensus that parenteral nutrition should be withhold for at least eight days even when the enteral nutrition is not possible or it is not adequate. And similarly in children as well, the same recommendation to um, withhold parenteral nutrition for at least eight days. The uh, caloric targets, there are many studies and I am sure the next speaker is going to elaborate more on uh, what the caloric tar targets should be, but uh, the recent evidence suggests that um, uh, to restrict the energy intake during acute critical illness and uh, it, it is safe not to overfeed the patients. There is a term which is known as uh, trophic or uh, trickle feeding, which means that uh, you don't fully feed the patients, or you don't try to fully meet the uh, caloric and the protein targets, but even if 25% of the total caloric target is achieved, it is beneficial for the patient. So this is known as uh, permissive underfeeding and this is now recommended. Then in surgical uh, patient, uh, mostly it is the surgeon's hesitation to start enteral nutrition after they have done an anastomosis and the patients ended up not getting anything for many days. But again, recent trials, they have shown that it is uh, not even safe, but it is beneficial at it. It improves outcomes if even after GI um, uh, surgery, patients are fed uh, enterally. Then there are also recommendations uh, to uh, use uh, uh, 
tube feeding, especially at the time of surgery. So it is really very important, the anesthesiologist as well as the intensivist, if the patient is going from ICU for surgery, to keep reminding uh, everybody in the OR to make sure that a tube is placed um, in the sm uh, small bowel tubing, uh, uh, because uh, within the operating room, surgeons, they are so focused in whatever they are doing that they forget to uh, do this. So they need to be uh, reminded. And uh, prokinetic agents like erythromycin and metoclopramide, the recommendation of the recent guidelines is to use them if uh, you feel that the patient, the gastric aspirate volumes are more or the patient is not tolerating the feed. So there is a tendency to underfeed the patients, but when it comes to micronutrients, uh, there is no reason why the micronutrients should not be replaced adequ uh, adequately, especially in parental nutrition to avoid the uh, refeeding syndrome. Then in surgical patients, uh, glutamine is now being recommended, especially in burns patient, if um, there are major burns, more than 20% of the total body surface area burns, and in trauma patients. But keeping in mind that uh, other patients, non-surgical patients, uh, glutamine has no role, and it can be harmful in case if the patient has liver or renal failure. So in surgical patients, especially trauma and burn patients, it is okay to um, give uh, oral glutamine, but not in other patients. Then in head injury patients, again, they should be fed as early as possible when they are hemodynamically stable. The anabolic strategies, um, these are very important for wound healing. And a lot of studies have done, especially in burn patients. So oxandrolone is an anabolic steroid. Obviously, it has no role in the acute phase of the illness. But once the acute phase has settled down and the patient is uh, no more catabolic, it, it, is, it is helpful to give anabolic steroids. But these studies are only limited to burn patients. So they are not applicable to ge generally to other patients. And insulin is used uh, not only to uh, control uh, hyperglycemia, but it is also has anabolic role and it improves wound healing. And again, it has been um, uh, studied in the setting of burn patients because they have big wounds and it, is, um, it helps in wound healing. Growth hormone, a lot of studies have done, but there is no recommendation to use growth hormones in uh, any sorts of patients. So as Dr. John, uh, Jonathan said earlier on that we have to reflect and we have to see uh, what exactly we are doing. So this is what we did in our surgical ICU at Aachen University in Karachi. We uh, wanted to uh, see uh, there is always a lot of talk about feeding the patients, surgical patients, but we really wanted to know, are we doing um, any good to the patient? And our objectives were to find out that what is the route that we are using and when do we start enteral nutrition and are we meeting the caloric and the protein targets? And unfortunately, the results were really um, an eye-opener. We were using enteral nutrition and it was usually started on the second day. The number of the patients is very small. It is only uh, 30 patients. Uh, but what was um, very disturbing was that uh, when it came to the requirement, so you can see the blue lines were the ener energy caloric requirement of the patients and they got only, only little bit. So there was a huge gap. And when it came to protein uh, replacement, the, the gap was even wider. So most of our patients were uh, hardly getting less than 25, uh, uh, like more, nearly half of the patients were getting less than 25% of whatever was the calculated caloric target. And uh, protein was even worse off. So th this is what happens when you reflect on what you are actually doing. And then this obviously, woke us up, opened our eyes, and the, uh, the thing to improve your service is to introduce protocols. And this is what we did, our nutrition and dietitian, they sat down together the pro and they designed protocols and then they took classes and trained the 
staff and now we are going to evaluate uh, uh, the data is being collected whether uh, we were able to make any impact or not. Thank you very much. <laughs>